Marriage. Marriage. It's an amazing thing. You start in the book of Genesis, the first miracle. God married Adam to Eve. He gave us marriage. He invented marriage. He defined marriage. Leave, cleave. One flesh, no shame, naked. God. Genesis, the Bible begins with marriage. Revelation, the Bible ends in marriage. The marriage feast of the Lamb. We who are in Christ, a part of the church, we are the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. And when we graduate and get to heaven, there's a banquet, there's a marriage feast of the Lamb, and there's a celebration in heaven. So Genesis begins with the miracle of marriage. Revelation ends with the miracle of marriage. You might say marriage encompasses all of the Bible. And there we have Jesus Christ performed his first miracle when? At Cana, at a marriage ceremony. So we look at marriage and we see that all the way through the scripture, God uses it as a metaphor, as a symbol, the best thing in human experience that we can understand the relationship we are privileged to have when we repent and receive Jesus Christ. And he says, I will save you. I will be Lord of your life. The best human illustration of that all the way through the scripture is the picture of marriage. Now, I've got a confession to make. When I was first married, I repeated those vows that the pastor uttered, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't know much about what I was repeating. I didn't know what a vow was. A vow is not a promise or a resolution. It's not something that you build into a contract. A vow is a vow made to God. It's sacred. And therefore, we can repeat those vows when we are married. We are saying them to our wife or our husband. Well, we're saying them in accordance as a word, as a vow to God. We can make promises and resolutions, and they can fade away. We can meet them or not meet them. But when you make a vow to God, it has eternal and permanent ramifications. And therefore, when we say those vows, you know, I remember my vows. I said, you know, this is, I know this is a legal thing, getting married. I understood that. And I understood what I thought love was. And there was chemistry and emotion there. But I didn't have really a clue as to the depth of what it meant to say vows to my wife or the wife saying vows to the husband. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. This is my third time this weekend of going over this service. So I've already practiced, so you have the finished product, I guess. <laughs> but last night when I did this and our Saturday night worship, a couple came out, handsome. They were smiling, and, and I spoke to them, and he said, you know, she didn't uh, recommit herself to marriage. She didn't commit herself to the vows. She said, and we're already married. And she smiled. I said, what do you mean? She said, look, I didn't know what I'd already committed myself to. And when you explained it, <laughs> I have to back up and think about it some more. <laughs> I said, I like you. You're honest. <laughs> it's good to find an honest woman now and then, isn't it? Or an honest man now and then. And so you take these vows. And where do they come from? We said the Garden of Eden. And they develop through the years, through all kinds of tradition in all parts of the world. And finally, in our Western world, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he instituted those classic vows you find in the Book of Common Prayer. 
And many people have written their own vows. And so we get married. Usually you repeat after the pastor these words and that are the vows that we utter. But they come at us from all kinds of places. For example, Elvis Presley. You ever heard of him? Elvis Presley in his classic Classic rendition of Love Me Tender. By the way, it was one of the few things that he sang that he wrote most of the words, one of the few. And in that Love Me Tender, believe it or not, those words encompass the biblical understanding of taking vows in marriage. Love me tender, love me true, never let me go. You have made my life complete, and I love you so. Love me tender, love me true, and the rest of it. Well, what do you have in that? It is amazingly biblical. Love. Tender. Tender could be a synonym for cherish. Love me true. Truth is a part of love. So you see an outline of the vows, and you have those three big elements as are described not only in the first stanza or the second stanza or the first chorus or the second chorus, even of love me tender, love me blue. So you have, first of all, in marriage, you have a vow to truth. It's built on the foundation of it. Look, look at the vows that you see up there. You see, first of all, you say, I, say your name, I, has, there's no promise, da, 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 from this day forward. And then you see, to love and to hold. You see it? I'd say, I, Edwin, take thee, Lisa, as my love and wedded wife, to love and to hold. Did you just jump over that when you said those words? To love, to hold, to, to hold, to have. All the, to, have and to, to have something means you own it, right? right? Uh, so you look at your wife or your husband and you say, I'm giving myself to you. You have me. And now you can hold me. You can hold me, put, hold me forward. You can pull me back. You can hold me up. You can hold me down. That's a lot of trust, isn't it? To have and to hold, and that's the foundation of truth. And by the way, you say, well, I'm single, I'm, I'm widowed, or, or I've never, I'm divorced, and this doesn't apply to me, or I'm young. Hey, some marriage applies to all of us. Everybody here needs to begin to understand the sacredness of marriage. So we all need to do this because we're in a whole series on relationships. And you have to start relationship with God in Christ, and then you move to marriage, and we'll move through relationships in our continuing study, believe it or not, of 1 Corinthians. And to have and to hold, that is the very basis, the very foundation of what it means to have a marriage based on truth. Love me tender, love me true. Not phony, not artificially, not just going through the motion, but love me True. So there has to be truth there. So in Kierkegaard, a philosopher, <laughs> Kierkegaard said that marriage is like going to a costume ball. And you dress in a complete costume. You put a mask on so nobody can recognize you. And you go through the ceremonies up front, the, the dancing, the banquet, and the entertainment. And at midnight, you take off the mask. And all of a sudden, somebody said, I didn't know that was you. We recognize one another. Kierkegaard said, that's the way it is with marriage. When you get married, you take off the mask. And all of a sudden, those little things you notice, maybe you were dating, now they become big things. I didn't know she was so jealous. Oh, I, I didn't know he was so prideful. I, I didn't know that she held grudges. I didn't know I had to live on the basis of bribery. And all those little bitty things that we saw or maybe perceived and maybe were covered up in other relationships, in marriage, 
Listen, folks, there's no place to hide. Truth is revealed. Truth, the mask is taken off. The good, the bad, the ugly. And you say, my goodness, I married a stranger. I had no idea. You wake up in the morning and gorilla breath. (laughs) Hair looks like you stuck your finger in an electric socket. I mean... And then he gets up and puts on on those old, dirty sweats, and he goes in the bathroom and make noises you wish you never had to hear. (laughs) Marriage. Revelation, open. No shame, openness. And, And that is the challenge of all of this in marriage. It's based on truth. It's the most intimate relationship that you have with your parents and children or brother or sister or friends, it it tops all of that. It is the most important relationship we have in our human life. And we have to understand that. We have to comprehend that. It's based on truth. And it reveals things about us to our spouse that we just wish they hadn't found out about that. It's like there's a bridge the bridge has a lot of cracks in it, a lot of, a lot of flaws, but you don't notice it. It's painted over. It looks good. It seems to be strong, but you let an 18-wheeler go over that bridge or a truck filled with concrete. What happens? That bridge, all the fishes, all the flaws begin to expose themselves, and you see the weakness in the bridge. Now, understand the truck didn't cause those weaknesses. The truck just Reveal those weaknesses, and marriage is like an 18-wheeler driving through your heart, and it exposes all the things about you and all the things about me. That's marriage, and therefore, marriage is based on truth and authenticity, and everything comes out in the open as it should. Marriage is the best preacher that you'll ever have to listen to and respond to and understand. In marriage, you have to talk, talk, talk. You have to listen, listen, listen. And you have to pray, pray, pray. Three triplets, very important. Men, we're generally poor listeners. And men, most of us, don't know how to handle our wives, when they come and tell us about a problem they have. Now, I wish the wives were not here right this minute because I'm going to tell these guys a secret that they'd better discover. I've spoken on it many times. I know it is accurate. Gentlemen, if your wife comes to you with a problem, they got a problem with this or a problem with that or a problem in a relationship, whatever the problem is, All you do is listen. And what you do, they state a problem. They say, well, I'm having a problem here on my job because so-and-so. And and you just say, oh, you're having a problem here on your job. You just repeat the problem (laughs) that they have. (laughs) Gentlemen, whatever you do, don't give an answer. (laughs) Don't try to solve the problem. It's a catastrophic mistake. (laughs) I always say, just hold the bucket. Oh, yes, uh, uh, what, what I hear you saying, what I, and that's what we do. So wives have to not only talk, they have to listen. Men have to talk. Men have to talk, and wives have to listen. And in all of this, there's pray, pray, pray. We're talking about a marriage that's based on truth, that's authentic. A marriage that's not just holding on. A marriage that does not settle for plan B. A lot of people are married. Well, we've been married a long time or a little while, and I know this and that and the other, and I never expected this, I never expected that, so I'm just going to live on plan B. God doesn't want us to live on plan B. We don't have to live on plan B. We have to simply respond to God's principles. And marriage is based on truth, and when truth comes out, all of a sudden, The light comes on. Things begin to happen. New chemistry comes, new joy, new sharing, new confidence, 
You trust. So marriage, first of all, we make a vow to truth. And also we make a vow to love. Now we're going to be talking about love for weeks to come in this study. But love is one of the most misunderstood words in all of the English language. In most languages, they have multiple expressions of love. We're here, we just say love. So we, we talk about love. Love is something that you do. You say, I fell in love. I have fallen out of love. No. One sinner married another sinner in a world full of sin. And you don't really fall in love and fall out of love. You see, we need to understand that in the sacredness of marriage, that God is love. You say, well, I already knew that. Are you sure? God is love. Read in 1 John 4, verse 16. It says, God is love. And we are to abide in God, then we abide in love. And God abides in us. And we know God is love. It means that to God, love is a noun. And we as human beings, we can love or not love because love is a, listen carefully, a verb. It's something you do. It's action. And then we hear the crazy little excuse. I can't help how I feel. Oh, there's a slippery slope. I can't help how I feel. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a news flash for you. It's true we can't help sometimes how we feel, but feelings are not determinative as to how we respond and what we do. And there are two classical schools of philosophy here. There's a stoic school. Stay with me. So I can't help how I feel, and those in the stoic school, represented by Immanuel Kant, would say, stomp out your feelings. Don't have any feelings. Don't have any emotions. Just steal yourself. And some people think that's how you handle feelings. I'll just, I'm not going to have any feelings. I'm not going to have any emotions. And you just shut down the emotions of your heart. Some people really believe that. And that's a whole school of philosophy. Other people believe, like Rousseau, they say, well, I can't help how I feel, and I just act on the way I feel. Boy, watch out for that idiot. Because they have the idea that feelings trump everything. Because I feel this way, that's the way it must be, and that's how I live my life. Feelings are not good or bad. You follow me? Good Feelings are not moral or immoral. Feelings are not determinative of ethics because, listen very, very carefully, to say, I can't help how I feel. You may not can help in one sense how you feel, but feelings aren't the things upon which we base our decision. Our decision is based on our free will and reason. Hello! You know, I feel like just pushing over this pulpit but in reason and free will, I don't push over the pulpit, okay? So you have these two schools of thought. Feelings are not determinative because all of a sudden we have free will and we have reason. So you've been whining around, well, I can't help how I feel. Quit saying it. Feelings are not determinative. Now, we need to have Feelings of our heart and feelings of our free will and mind, they both need to work together. Certainly we have feelings. Certainly we have free will and rational thinking, but they are compatible to one another. Our rational thinking doesn't determinative. Our feelings are not determinative, but our rational thinking and free will is what dominates what we do and what we say and how we live. You got it? Very important. So if I do something that is good, I have good feelings, happiness comes. I do something that is bad or unseemly, all of a sudden I feel guilt and unhappiness comes. That's just how life works. Oh, in marriage, all of this is ratcheted up to another higher and higher octave, isn't it? Because 
That's the person that you relate to, you live to. That is your friend, your companion for life. And so to have and to hold from this day forward, that's a vow to truth. And look, what is the definition of love here? Look at the vows. It said for better, for worse. You see it? This says for richer, for poor, sickness, and in health, and then to love. In other words, it gives us a definition of love, better for worse. What is the better? To be richer, to have things you can live on and be adequate. What's the worst? You can be poor and have nothing. I've had both of those, both of those many times. And then you say, well, I, in sickness, I've had that. And in health, I've had that. All of this is what it means to love. And this is a part of the vow to love. Not a feeling. It's part of it. But it's primarily a free will, a choice. It's a verb. You choose to love. And that is a magnificent thing. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing that we can do. Therefore, in marriage, you have the most intimate, practical kind of love that you can find anywhere on the planet. Now, some people have the idea that love is a river, and in the middle of this river, there's marriage, here, too, they love each other in that river. Sometimes the river is almost dry. Sometimes it's functioning. No, 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 that's not the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is these two so love one another that their love overflows into the rest of life. Illustration. You can say, well, I love everybody. That's all fine, but that's generality. You need to love in particular. That's where the power is. God so loved Abraham. Know your Bible? He said, Abe, I'm going to take you and build a great people out of you. Why did he just call out Abraham? Why did he just build a special people out of Israel, a little backwater country there? What was God doing? That was a rather limited kind of, doesn't can't love, God love everybody? No, he loved uniquely Abraham, uniquely Israel, because he knew out of that love would flow the coming of his son, and who did Jesus love? What he loved the world, but yet Jesus especially built into those early apostles the principles of life and love. Why did he have a thousand people he discipled, a thousand people he spent time with? It's because he knew that rather limited area of love, a limited area of love, that he would love them and their love would spill out to the whole wide world. So what do we do in our marriage relationship? We love one another. Therefore, we have been loved, and we have now the capacity to love, the capacity to love that we didn't have before. And so when we love our wife and our wife loves our husband, you've got love there that spills off everywhere you go, everywhere you do, and it gets broader and broader. And therefore, in this SOS time in our nation, One of the finest things we can do is have a marriage relationship built on love, and then as we have been loved, we're able to love. I can love only as I've been loved. Understand the love of God, understand the love of my wife. Then I have the capacity to love. And that's the problem with some people. They haven't known love in their family. They haven't known love in a relationship. They have a trouble giving love, expressing love, even being married in love. But love comes to us, and we realize that explodes, and love becomes a a fire. Wherever we go, there's just love. And that's how we best serve God. That's how we best serve Christ. Also, there's another part of this vow. Not only when we get married, there's a vow to truth, a vow to love. Also, there's a vow to cherish. Boy, that's a big little word. And you see there, to love, there's a definition, better for worse, rich or poor, and then to cherish, till death do us part. That sounds like a long time to me. And when you cherish someone, you prize them. You put them on a pedestal. You listen. You love. You encourage. You're there for them. 
They, they know that everything could drop out of light, but you're going to be there because you're in the cherishing business. I can tell you a secret. And I, I believe this completely. I know it through a long time of experience. I can look at any couple, any couple, spend a little time with you, and I will know if there's some cherishing going on. You can't fool me. Oh, I can't. No, you can't. I've seen all the ha, 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 but I've seen the real thing too. To cherish, to cherish. Oh, that's special. When cherishing is going on, I look out to a couple right out here. I can tell you, there's cherishing in that relationship. I, I don't know either your name. I know your face. There's I can tell that. You can't fool me. It's there. I can look at others and I won't comment. You see, my when, when you're cherished, oh, that does something for you. It lights you up. We have to learn how to do it. And therefore, I think we're ready to repeat these vows. If, if you're here and you're with your wife, your husband, you'd like to restate these vows with a new understanding of them, right? I want you to stand to your feet right now. Your wife, your husband, would you do that? I want to repeat these vows. Lisa, come up here, would you? I haven't let her do that up till now. I, I didn't want to get, I couldn't marry myself or, or anything else, but uh, we're going to do this as well. Now, I want you to face one another like this. And I, I won't do this, but I, I will have to kind of move a little bit. And I want you to look at your wife and look at your husband. Don't look at me. All right, now usually when we have wedding ceremonies, we rehearse. So I'm gonna have a little rehearsal, so I'm gonna say like, I will say, I, Edwin, take thee, Lisa, to be my wedding wife. But you state your name, gentlemen, then you state your wife's name, and in a great feeling of emotion and commitment, I want you to say these words after me. All right, here we go, are you ready? I. Edwin, take thee, Lisa, say your wife's name. You're not marrying Lisa. She's already claimed. <laughs> take thee, Lisa, to be my wedded wife. That's so weak. To have, gentlemen, to have, to hold from this day forward for better, for worse. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, to cherish, till death do us part, according to God's holy gift. Now, ladies, you'll do the same thing. By the way, in the service Saturday night, I forgot to leave the ladies, so they're only half married back there in that service. <laughs> But I'm not going to make that mistake today. Ladies, I want you to say this to your husband. All right, here we go. I take thee, everybody, to be my, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold, in sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth, to love, to, love to, cherish, to cherish, till death do us part, part. according to God's holy gift. To God's holy gift. All right, I didn't do that very well. Now, if you'd like to and you have rings, take your ring off, ladies, and, and, give, uh, and, and guys, and give your ring uh, to your wife, and, and your wife will give her ring to, to the husband there and now we're going to have the exchange of rings just look at your mate there first of all to the men do you give this ring to your wife as a token of your love for her you say I do and wives will you receive this ring as a symbol as a token of your wife of your husband's love for you I will, I will. all right go to third finger left hand Now, I'm going to tell you something about the ring you may not know. In the early church, 
when they'd get married, they'd put the ring, both rings on the middle finger, and they would remind everybody that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was a part of this, this vow, this marriage, and then they would put the ring on the finger. So just a little reminder there as to what we do. Okay, now we are the wise, and you say your name. Do you? Lisa. All right, ladies, stay with you. <laughs> do you? Let me just say, it. do you wise? Do you wise give this ring as a toll of your love for your husband? I do. When you give, it's I do. We rehearse this a lot. When you give, it's I do. When you receive, it's I will. Let's try it again, ladies. Here we go. Do you give this ring to your husband as a toll of your love for him? I do. Husbands, will you receive this ring and wear it as a symbol to toll to your wife's love for you? Gosh, now you may kiss the bride. <laughs> And be seated. I don't know how your other marriage was when you began, but you're really married now, right? <laughs> you're really married now. A story that Gary Thomas tells in his book on Cherish, great book. He tells a story about Miss Thailand. 2015, a beautiful young woman was elected Miss Thailand. Man, she was just not dead, beautiful, intelligent, Christian, lovely. I mean, she had all the graces you'd want any woman to have. And now she was crowned with that tiara. Miss Thailand, beautifully dressed. My goodness, as things ended there in the very public televised, highly, highly regarded show in Thailand, she walked out and went and found her mother. Her mother was in front of garbage cans because her mother was a garbage picker and though a single parent, she had brought up her children by taking garbage and trash and reselling it. That's how she made a living. And so now this Miss Thailand went and found her mother and she just fell down in front of her and cherished her. And a picture was taken that went all over the internet, all over Asia. This beautiful, now honored young woman so bowed down and cherished her mother. As a result of that, this mother who had been a trash picker most all of her adult life became sort of famous because she was cherished by this beautiful daughter. And people would see her and wave to her and, and she had other offers to do other things. And she said, no, I'm a trash picker. I'm not ashamed of that. That's just who I am. You see, that's what cherishing does when you cherish somebody when you cherish somebody. All of us, we got a lot of garbage and trash on us, in us. But our Heavenly Father, who loved us so totally and completely, sent his son down to the lowest, 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 lowest rung of life and died for us so that our garbage might be cleaned up. That's... That's coming to Christ. That's experiencing a brand new beginning. Some here need to do that right now in this service. When we're singing in a moment, a list of the people saying, we'll come down this aisle and say, well, that's what I want. I know God came all the way down to, to me with the garbage and trash and made me brand new as I repented and received Christ and let him run my life. If you need that new life, that's exactly what you do. That's exactly what you do. If you're a Christian, you need a church where you can worship and serve and grow. Come in the family here with us. That's what God does for us in Jesus Christ. So now we're going to have a most unusual time of invitation. We're not going to sing. 
But in the spirit of marriage and celebration of life, in the spirit of taking a vow, a vow to God, uh, a vow to truth, a vow to love, a vow to cherish. What we hear at weddings so many times is my, the prayer, the prayer. So it's going to be sung and nobody move, but as God leads, you come and say, I'm coming to Christ today. It was Labor Day. <laughs> I want that sacred relationship. I'm coming as a Christian in the life of this church. As he leads, no one moves except those who are standing, make a circle right in front of me, and say, I'm coming home. I want that new life. I, I want that church relationship. As he leads, you come as this is our hymn of invitation, the prayer.